Good evening. You are listening to WUVT FM 90.7 Blacksburg with simulcast on WEHC 90.7 Emory. My name is Felix Redmond. And my name is Mary Peyton Marble. You are tuned into WUVT News, here with an exclusive debate for Virginia's 9th Congressional District. We are joined today by Republican incumbent Morgan Griffith and Democratic challenger Karen Baker. WUVT News believes in fair, free, and informative press. So we would like to thank both candidates for joining us today and for giving our listeners firsthand coverage of this upcoming election. Each candidate will be given a five or will be given five minutes for opening statements, and we'll begin with Karen Baker. Good morning, or good evening, actually. My name is Karen Baker, and I am running for Congress to bring new and effective leadership for the Ninth District. I am a practicing attorney, a retired federal administrative law judge, and an RN. I am a listener and a problem solver. I will work with anyone in Congress who is serious about solving rural issues and expanding rural economies. My opponent has had 14 years to listen to and problem solve for the Ninth District, and he's done neither. He has presided over a depressed economy here in the Ninth District for all of those 14 years without offering any meaningful investment or solutions. The United States has a booming economy, the strongest in the world, in fact, but the people of the Ninth District continue to struggle to meet basic needs. My opponent voted against the infrastructure bill that included investments in roads and bridges in a deeply rural district where people have to commute to work. He voted against the Inflation Reduction Act that led to lower prescription drug costs for our seniors for life-saving medications like insulin. He voted against our veterans by voting against the PACT Act, which allows veterans to receive service-connected disability for exposure to Middle East burn pits. He voted against our union miners' pensions and health care plans and against funding the Black Lung, Black Lung Trust Fund, while thousands of retired miners gasp for air after years underground. Everywhere I go in the 9th District, and I have been all over the 9th District the past six months, people tell me how frustrated they are by Ballot Health, the monopoly that was created in 2018, and the lack of quality health care they receive and the time it takes to, for the, them to get seen. The March of Dimes has declared the 9th District a maternity desert. Women have to commute long distances to receive prenatal and maternity care, which have led to an increase in mortality rates. Mr. Griffith has squandered every opportunity he's had for over 14 years to address every one of these issues. He has repeatedly said it's not his problem, but if it's not his problem, then whose is it? I want to go to Washington to fight for the respect and resources the 9th District has earned and we deserve. I want to come home every weekend and listen to what is working and not working for our people here in the 9th. I want to decentralize health care and create a model that is better suited to serving rural people and communities. I want to increase federal funding for our public schools because a quality public education should not be determined by zip code. I want enhanced availability for technical and trade education so that our children have skills to, learn, to earn a living wage. I want to bring union tradespeople in to teach in our high schools so that our young people can see how trades training can, can produce bright futures. I want to expand the number of USDA inspectors and fund regional abattoirs so our small farmers can get their products to market. An effective representative is present, accessible, and responsive. None of these words describe my opponent. An effective representative is a creative leader who brings people together to be the best we can be. That is not my opponent. My life has been one of service. I have always represented the little guy. I want to serve as your rep representative in Congress because you deserve someone who will fight right alongside you for a better life for all of us here in Appalachia. My job will be to fight for us all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baker, More, uh, Representative Griffith. Thank you all for inviting me. I am the current congressman in the 9th District of Virginia, and I am proud to represent the people in the 9th District. 
The 9th District, as many of you know, is a very large district. By landmass, it's larger than nine states. It's a lot of miles. It goes from the edge of Lynchburg all the way to the Cumberland Gap, touching four additional states. So I'm looking tonight to uh, an honest exchange of ideas. Look, I have strong views, and I'm sure that Ms. Baker has strong views as well, and we'll hear about them tonight. I have a lot of respect for anyone who is willing to throw their hat into the ring and seek public office. Running for office takes a huge commitment of time and resources. So Ms. Baker and I are going to disagree on a lot of the issues, but I respect her, and I believe we can disagree without being disagreeable. Every two years, people say this is the most important election in the history of the United States. If we didn't say it every two years, it might be more believable. Still, it's not hard to think that this election is an extremely important one. We are presented this year with two visions of America. One vision rests upon the idea that we can tax and spend our way to prosperity. That government regulations are the only thing that stands between us and anarchy. That if we sap our police forces and allow minor crimes to go unprosecuted, that crime will fall. That weakness on the international stage is strength. That massive government debt and spending have nothing to do with rising prices and inflation. That energy is created with pixie dust and massive government subsidies that make us all poorer. That the right to bear arms is some sort of silly idea held by people 250 years ago and has no relevance to us today. That big government is, the, is always right and the disagreement with the government is either misinformation or hate speech. That abortion is health care. That open borders are inevitable and nothing can be done. My vision is different. Smaller government is better. Consistent de deficit spending has bad consequences. The government is not always right. Law and order are important at every level. Free speech must be protected. We can control our borders. The list goes on. I disagree with my friends in the Democrat Party. I don't think they're evil. I just think they're wrong. And that's okay. Elections are about choices. The founding fathers wrote a constitution that required election of the entire House every two years, and that's appropriate. So incumbents like me are required to go back to the people that elected them in the first place, hat in hand, and ask for their vote, to ask for their stamp of approval. That's appropriate. Part of having a two-party system is that vo voters get a choice, and because we really only have two parties, voters get a pretty good idea of what each candidate and each party stands for. If you think the Democrats and the Biden-Harris administration have been good for America, you should vote Democrat. If you don't like their policies and the direction they're taking this country, if you're thinking we're better four years ago and you want something different, you can vote Republican. I've worked hard over the last two years to represent you and your views in Congress, and I would like to continue working for you in Washington, D.C. and in the 9th Congressional District. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Griffith. We will begin questions now, starting with <coughs> Ms. Karen Baker. Democratic nominee Kamala Harris has campaigned on a promise to restore reproductive freedom on a federal level. On your platform, you have stated that a woman's right to choose is a state issue. How would you support a federal, would you support a federal ratification of Roe v. Wade and could fellow Democrats in the House count on your vote? You have three minutes. Okay. Let me first say that Roe v. Wade allowed states to determine um, the extent of, of termination of pregnancies within certain bounds. So there's always been a state role for what those bounds are. I believe that women's decisions regarding reproduction are to be respected. I believe that women individually know their lives and they know their limits and they, with their doctors and their families, are entitled to make decisions for their lives. I would like to point out that two-thirds of abortions are for women who already have children. And these women are making economic decisions about their future and their families' futures. And I don't know what their motivation is. I don't know what their situation is. And neither does my opponent. None of us know. The only people that know are the people that are involved. So I always tell people that when the opposition um, has in, in acted maternal maternity leave, 
when, peop- when women are given paid leave to have children and decent paid leave to have children, when we have affordable child care in this country, when we have paid family leave in this country, I might believe them that their concern is life. But because they are against all of these policies, I believe that their concern is only birth, but not life. So I will always vote for women's decisions about their reproduction to be respected. And that means that I will examine whatever the the law is that is brought forth that you asked about initially. I will examine that law, and I will discuss this in my district at length, and then we will, the district and I, make a decision about it. But everything I always do will be in consultation with the people in my district. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Representative Griffith, you have three minutes to respond. I've made no bones about it. I'm pro-life. I believe that a baby inside the mother's womb is a life. Um, I think we have to protect both the mother's interests and the baby's interests. And unfortunately, under Roe v. Wade, uh, it allowed abortion all the way up to the end. Late-term abortions have always been wrong. We can get into arguments even within the Republican Party at where the line is drawn. But this is something that is, and I will agree with with my opponent on this, I do believe the states have that decision. That's, that's, that's what the Supreme Court ruled uh, in their opinion overturning Roe v. Wade is that it is uh, not a constitutionally guaranteed right and the states can make decisions in their own manners, in their own choices. There will be f- lawsuits about how far they can go. That's natural and normal. But I'm pro-life and I want to protect the lives of the babies and the moms. Now, that doesn't mean that we have no role subsequent to the birth of the baby. I have supported programs to help uh, moms who are young and trying to get things done. I've supported programs to help those who don't want to have the baby and put that baby up for adoption. Uh, These are important factors that we need to take into account. And a lot of babies that are born today, particularly in some negative circumstances where the mom may be in some negative situations, have psychological issues either because they're drug dependent, alcohol dependent, uh, et cetera, because of bad choices that that the mom made. And so I believe that parents that that come in and say, we will take that child, deserve help from the federal government in raising that child. So it is important that we look uh, to the benefits of the child as well, but I'm pro-life and that's the bottom line. Thank you, Representative Griffith. Representative Griffith, (coughs) colleges act as one of the largest spaces for young voters in this district. How do you expect to gain support from this population, considering that students are more likely to vote blue? Well, I mean, it's it's always the case that students are more likely to vote blue. Their professors tend to be more blue as they they get older. Sometimes they switch uh, back to being uh, Republicans. Uh, And so, you know, what you do is you try to talk to as many students as you can, but we're going to have some disagreements. Uh, There's no question with some of the students. Uh, As you know, as as we talked about earlier, I'm meeting my son, who's a Virginia Tech student. Uh, Later tonight, he's a freshman. Uh, We're going to have some food. Uh, So not everybody is going to vote Democrat in this election, but there's no question that they tend to vote uh, Democrat. You know, it's kind of like Winston Churchill. I'm going to paraphrase because we don't have we're not able to have notes, so I can't give you the exact. He used to say that anybody that wasn't liberal when they were young didn't have a heart and anybody who didn't vote conservative as they got older didn't have a brain. And I would submit to you that we'll get a sufficient number of votes out of uh, Virginia Tech and certainly out of the rest of the Ninth District of Virginia. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Ms. Baker, you have three minutes to respond. First of all, I'd like to say that the Ninth District, Southwestern Virginia, has more college students than any other region in the country in in the state, because our our young people really want to learn, and they want to grow, and they want to expand their horizons, and they want to be educated, and it should be applauded. Also, our students have to deal with where they come from. And where they come from are communities that are depressed in the 9th District. And when our current representative offers no hope for the 9th District, then our students know 
that maybe that's not the way to go. I hope our students know that I care very, very much about our future. I care very much about uh, having a robust education for everyone. I care about people having the funds to be educated. Uh, things like Pell Grants have not kept pace with, with the cost of living over the years. It's this cost of education has risen dramatically even at state universities. So we need to have more paths for young people. And that includes having extensive tech and trade education in our high schools so that kids can go and have a good paying job and then maybe later go to college. But I don't think that our students are voting just with their heads or just with their hearts. I think our students are voting about who they think supports their journey through life. And I think that that's me. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Baker. As a reminder, you are tuned in to WUVT 90.7 Blacksburg with simulcast on WEHC 90.7 Emory. This is a live congressional debate for Virginia's 9th District. We are joined by Republican incumbent Morgan Griffith and Democratic challenger Karen Baker. This next question will be for both candidates. No, that was... Uh, I went, she went, rebuttal would be back to me. The question was posed to you, which gave um, Ms. Baker an opportunity to respond. Okay. No, That's the... Um, All right. That's fine. As long as we know what we're doing. Yes. Um, Republican, uh, excuse me, Representative Griffith, you will be answering this question first. Um, a recent poll from Roanoke College found that a plurality of Virginia voters believe the economics the economy, jobs, and inflation are the prevailing issues in the Commonwealth. What is your view on the economic state of Virginia currently, and what steps will you take to improve it? Representative Griffith, you have three minutes for your answer. Thank you very much. Appreciate the question. Uh, look, there's, there's different Virginias, and that was one of the points I was going to make if I got a rebuttal. A lot of students from Virginia Tech do come from the 9th District, but a lot of them also come from other parts of the state, and so that you have a lot of different economic backgrounds coming here to Virginia Tech. And so Virginia as a whole looks pretty good. Uh, we've added more jobs. Uh, Glenn Youngkin's done a great job as governor. He's the chief economic uh, development officer for the state of Virginia. The 9th District's a little more stressed. A large part of that has to do with our industries, many of which were shut down over the years by federal regulations and federal decisions. So at one time, when y'all were young or even not yet born, the industries were coal, furniture, textiles, tobacco, and agriculture. Agriculture is the only one that remains completely healthy. So we have to figure out ways to come in and improve things. As a result, I have gone in and I created a program for Virginia. It was modeled on something that was being done in Kentucky called the Ambler Program, and we have gotten millions and millions of dollars to redevelop abandoned coal mine lands so that we can bring economic development into the coal fields where the unemployment is at its highest. Further, Along with the two state senators who are who are Democrats, uh, Kane and Warner, we have worked to bring in uh, to deep southwest Virginia the Coalfields Expressway, and it is well on its way to being built. It's not finished yet. We're fighting to get money again this year. Also, right here at Virginia Tech, almost every year, I find money that helps bring in research here, but also creates economic development opportunities. And my favorite right now is Meld out of Christiansburg, a company where the owner is a woman-owned business. And she fought hard to make sure that she got her ideas out there. And she's now one of the leading uh, industries in the world related to using heavy metals, hard metals, in 3D printing. And she's doing great things. And Virginia Tech's working with her. New River, New River Community College is working with her. And it's going to bring jobs into the New River Valley. So we're constantly looking for new ways to do things. I've done economic development, uh, help build economic development facilities. And I will continue to do that because we have to make it attractive to businesses to move into the 9th District. Thank you, Representative Griffith. Ms. Baker, we will begin your rebuttal. You have three minutes to respond. Let me first say that the Amler program was um, instituted long before Mr. Griffith was ever in office. Um, he says that he's the leading, leading proponent of it, but it was a bipartisan action long before he arrived. Now, as for the 9th District and economic development, 
Mr. Griffith's predecessor, Rick Boucher, saw his role as one of being an advocate for the Ninth District. He went out and sought business to come to the Ninth District. He was constantly looking for ways to create economic growth and development through creative ideas. That when Mr. Griffith got elected, we got neglected. No longer was there a champion for business in the Ninth District. No longer was there someone meeting with people constantly, figuring out creative ways to get us what we need. We have been neglected for 14 years. He has squandered the chance to be our advocate. And that's what it takes, is an advocate to get out there. Among other things, it takes the things that we don't have, like effective broadband and, um, and, and cell service for all of our people. This has been going on for years, and th- there is no clear reason to me why most of this district still doesn't have effective broadband, why large parts of the district still don't have cell service, which makes business a very difficult thing to conduct. So when I get to Congress, the very first thing I will do is find out where is the problem or where are the problems and what can we do to fix it so we can create a better environment for business by having effective, complete broadband and cell service in the district. Thank you, Ms. Baker. If you have any more uh, words to share about the original question, you have another three minutes for your response, and then we will move on to the rebuttal. If that doesn't work, we can also do a rebuttal from Representative Griffith. Okay, the original question being... I can repeat it real quick. Yeah, please. A recent poll from Roanoke College found that a plurality Mm. of Virginia voters believe that the the economy, jobs, Mm. and inflation are the prevailing issues in the Commonwealth. What is your view on the economic state of Virginia currently, and what steps will you take to improve it? You have three minutes. As I stated, um, the 9th District, and I agree with... um, with my opponent, that the Ninth District has not partaken of the general well-being of the rest of the state. In fact, we in the Ninth uh, know that um, people say, what's beyond Roanoke? I have no idea. And this is something that I want to change because we need an advocate in the Ninth District. It is a huge problem. We are lacking jobs. We are lacking economic development completely. And as I said, for us to get what we need, we need broadband, we need um, an advocate, and we need some federal programs. Because the fact of the matter is, when you're in a very rural district, the profit motive is not going to bring you everything you want because there isn't a lot of profit to be had looking in from the outside. Too much space, not enough people. And that means that there's a limited opportunity for initial profit. And that means we have to have incentives for businesses to come. And we need to have creativity in developing businesses to come. We have the beginnings of a wonderful um, economic revival in the Ninth because of all the professional schools that are in the Ninth, veterinary school, pharmacy school, physical therapy school, law school, and these can be, and also UVA-wise. So we have the chance to build together, working with this, businesses that would make sense. For example, perhaps a company that makes generic veterinary medicines. And there's a vet school right there, plus wonderful cattle farms available for for. Um, use of these analogs. So there, there are chances. It's just a matter of being creative and being relentless in being an advocate for the ninth. Thank you, Ms. Baker. We will now move on to rebuttal from Representative Griffith. You have three minutes to respond. Thank you very much. Let's get the record clear first about Amler. I understand there were programs to, to take down high walls and do some other things prior to Amler, but Amler was a new project. It was called a pilot project. It was originally for three states, West Virginia, Kentucky, and Pennsylvania. It was authorized by those three states. The idea belonged to Hal Rogers. When that first came through, I immediately said, wait a minute, what about Virginia? So I went in and I fought and I got the money put into the House budget for Virginia, Alabama, and Ohio, the three next states, 
with the most abandoned line, the abandoned mine land. And the difference from the older programs, so this was a brand new program, the difference with the older programs were you could only solve the problem. You couldn't twist it into an economic development opportunity. As a result of using the money from Ambler, which did not exist in Virginia until I was a congressman, that program did not exist prior to me being in Congress, we were able to create an uh, uh, economic development opportunities in two different counties. One of them, we did take down a high wall, which the old money might have gotten to. In the second one, the folks at the Office of Surface Mining specifically said, if we had relied on the other program, the existing program, it would have taken many more years. I think that, if I recall correctly, they said it would take 20 years, and it would have cost $12 million. Instead, under Ambler, we spent about $4.5 million, and now, while people may disagree about what you do with the property, that property is now available for economic development. So I think that's important to remember. Also, I have always supported the Appalachian Regional Commission. That pumps a lot of money into the 9th District. It brings a lot of hope into the 9th District. It does a lot of important things in the 9th District. I have always been a strong advocate of that. These are the things that we need to do, but to, to not recognize that we are a rural mountainous district with lots of jobs that went away because of federal policies, and to not recognize that in order to, to do something, it's not going to happen overnight. That when you create, uh, like Norton did, a new industrial park, you're not going to fill that industrial park up in the first four or five years. It may take you as long as 20 years to fill that park up. So I have put in place the building blocks for a strong economy in southwest Virginia, and I will continue to work to make sure that we have the opportunities that we deserve in the 9th District. Thank you. Representative Griffith. Um, Ms. Baker, your website mentions rural housing initiatives as part of a four-pronged plan for housing needs of Virginians. As a representative of this district, how will residents of rural areas see differences in costs, options, and quality of their housing choices with your legislation as well as with legislation brought up by other members which you would potentially vote for? You have three minutes to respond. Okay. Let me say this, that the growth in the Ninth District requires a number of different um, conditions. You have to start somewhere, but we need better housing. It's difficult to bring businesses in when there's not insufficient housing even for the people that are already here. You need better health care because people don't want their families to come to a place where to have a baby you might have to drive 65 miles over twisty mountain roads in the middle of winter with snowing and ice and that doesn't seem safe we need better education so that our kids are prepared to take high tech jobs and we need we need housing obviously so what would it look like and this is a question that's going on all over the country what would it look like to provide better housing there are lots of initiatives out there. There's lots of things that are being worked on. There are foundations that provide low-cost loans for young families. I totally support having low-cost federally insured loans so that young families can afford to pay a reasonable mortgage and having a longer period for that. Now, we already do that with farms in the Ninth District and across rural America, having a longer period of repayment. But we also have to have initiatives to bring more housing and to rehabilitate housing. And that's going to require, that's going to require federal dollars. But it's worth it because that small investment makes for a, the growth of the Ninth District along with every other thing that needs to be done. So I don't have any specific legislation at this time, but I am aware that there are bright minds out there addressing this question for rural America and the housing issue and coming up with ideas and plans. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Representative Griffith, you have three minutes for a rebuttal. Yeah, I will tell you one of the things that's, that's really driving part of this, not all of it, but part of it is a lot of new regulations on whether you're rehabbing a house or whether you're building a new house, there are all kinds of requirements brought in as a part of green uh, policies that make the cost of the building materials more expensive and, it, th and make the building more expensive. You make it more expensive to build something, it's going to cost more for somebody to buy that house. 
Likewise, there are other federal regulations. There's one program that I've already put in some legislation, some language, and hopefully we'll be able to get that done. Uh, and, and it is, is that the federal government, if you're doing taking like an old school and turning that into affordable housing, which can be done, and we have a lot of old schools in southwest Virginia that have shut down because the population's gone down, we can take those and turn those into affordable housing. But if you want to do a government uh, pri- public-private partnership, the government is wants to take what's called a reversionary clause, and they don't call it that, but that's what most of us who practiced in the area of real estate know it as, that says that if, you know, in eternity or, you know, at any time in the future, it's no longer used for its original purpose, the federal government gets it back. Most of your development folks don't want to take that risk because if they're trying to sell somebody an affordable house or create affordable housing, you don't want to have the risk that if your program fails for any reason, all of a sudden your entire asset gets sucked back up by the federal government. Also, I would have to point out that that while it's easy to say, we're going to do this and we're going to do that and we can spend the federal dollars, we are running a huge deficit in this country. And when we continue to have this deficit, what we're doing is we're mortgaging students at Virginia Tech and students at Emory and Henry's future. Now, there are programs that are worth it, and I'm not saying this isn't one that might be worth it, but we have to watch our spending. We can't just constantly say, oh, let's create a new program, let's spend new dollars. We have to try to prioritize. We've not done a good job of that in, in the last few years. We need to do a better job. Both parties in the in the White House have not done a great job of, of helping us in Congress eliminate some of these programs that maybe ought to be eliminated in, in lieu of something better. But we have to work on that. And I will continue to work to try to keep the deficit under control as best we can. I mean, it's, it's in bad shape right now. The deficits and the long-term spending have got to be brought under control. So we can't just say every time there's a problem, well, we're going to spend more federal money on it. Because if we do, we're bankrupting the future. Thank you, Representative Griffith. Um, Follow-up question for this. Um, Ms. Baker, what specific challenges do you foresee in gaining support for your initiatives, and how will you overcome them to ensure tangible benefits for rural residents? You have three minutes for a response. First, let me say that an individual sitting next to me voted for $1.3 trillion in tax breaks for wealthy corporations and very, very wealthy individuals. And there was no concern at that time, which was just a few years ago, that it would increase the federal deficit, which it did dramatically. So it's a matter of priorities, and my opponent's priority is giving tax breaks to corporations so they can buy back their own stock and give um, big bonuses to themselves and for wealthy individuals, very wealthy individuals. That's not my priority. My priority is using federal dollars when there is no profit motive to be had, meaning rural. So we have to kickstart the economy, kickstart the progress with federal dollars. So how will I get um, how will I get support from me? First of all, my opponent mentioned the Appalachian Regional Commission arc and says it puts a lot of money into the um, economy. It actually puts about $185 million a year over 427 different jurisdictions, so that's pretty much jump change per each one. It's not going to solve the problem. However, getting Appalachian representatives, both Republicans and Democrats, together to make a very loud voice and let people know what our plight is may have some moral suasion in getting people to look at what we need in rural America. And I'm going to use moral suasion every chance I get. I'm also going to work with Republicans and Democrats who are all in the same situation as I, as my district is to find solutions for our rural districts that are creative, that are exciting, and will help to develop our districts. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Uh, Representative Griffith, you have two minutes for a rebuttal. I I really appreciate having an opportunity to talk about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. We took the highest rate for corporate taxes from 35 to 21. That puts us in a range with all the other countries in the world or with most of the high economic performers. Uh, Europe is at 21.1. We're at 21. Uh, You want to go up 0.1%? Okay, maybe you got a case. Otherwise, what you're doing is, is these companies are all large companies across the world and they can shift those jobs. So you want to get rid of jobs? Don't 
continue the jobs the Jobs Act, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Don't continue that. That's the Democrat position is we need to get rid of that. They always want to talk about the big companies, but the big companies produce jobs. Now let me say something else. People forget people forget that there were a lot of things in there, not just for corporate taxes. It also applies to Main Street businesses. But we also dramatically increased the child tax credit in your income taxes. That's a part of that plan. That comes to an end at the end of the year if we don't renew it. That's one of the fights in this election. Do we want to have the economy percolating? Because when we passed that, prior to COVID hitting, the economy was doing great. We were adding jobs at a huge clip, and inflation was at 1.4% when Donald Trump left office. 1.4% year over year. It's gone way up. The spending that we've done since then has not worked. The, t- the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act created jobs, and it cut taxes for all Americans. And last but not least, if you don't think corporations pass on the, the increased cost to their customers, you're wrong. So it's the average citizen that ends up paying if they choose to stay in the United States, or they take those jobs and they take them out of Pulaski and they send them to Poland. Thank you, Representative Griffith. Representative Griffith. You were over 100 Republicans to question the integrity of the 2020 election, despite ample evidence proving its legitimacy, including statements from former President Donald Trump's Department of Homeland Security. Do you see your actions following the 2020 election as reckless and considering the violent events on January 6, 2021, which were spurred on by the claims of voter fraud? You have three minutes to respond. So let me say first. I did not support any violence. Don't think there should have been any violence. I really thought they screwed up the process because we had a case to make. I never went, if you go back and look at all my statements, I never went with the fraud in the election side. I saw that as a state responsibility. But here's the problem. Congress is given the responsibility of determining if the laws of federal elections were, in fact, followed in the various states. And it's one of those things that people don't realize because they didn't study it, and I, I love history and I love the law. The first time this came up was 1865. The United States Congress disenfranchised the electors of the state of Louisiana. They, at that time, had to send a bill to the President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. In his signing message, Abraham Lincoln said, Congress has the authority to determine whether or not the electors are appropriately elected and whether or not they were illegally elected. And I'm paraphrasing again. I don't have that quote but that they were whether or not they were illegally legally or illegally elected. As a result, I make no opinion on the bill itself because the executive branch should not be involved in the determination of whether or not the electors should count or not, but that is the responsibility under the 12th Amendment. This is Lincoln. Under the 12th Amendment of the Constitution, it's the responsibility of Congress. Flash forward to year 2000, Palm Beach, uh, Bush versus Palm Beach uh, a registrar, a unanimous Supreme Court ruled that the law that governs the federal election of the president and the electors is the valid way to go, and that if you leave the safe haven created by the law, your electors could be challenged by Congress. Subsequently, in Bush versus Gore, there was a dissent by Ruth Bader Ginsburg who said the court should not be making this final decision. That is a decision to be made by the members of Congress when they sit and determine who the proper electors are from the various states on January 6th. That was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I understand there's lots of people who've brought up questions since then, but the bottom line is the law absolutely made it valid for members of Congress to question the states that didn't follow the federal law in changing their rules in the 2020 election. And I stand by that. Thank you, Representative Griffith. Ms. Baker, you have three minutes to respond. First, let me say that... Mr. Griffith voted against certifying the election, which was, of course, after the incursion into the Capitol by the rioters. He still voted against certifying the election for absolutely no known or articulated reason other than they didn't like the outcome. He joined a lawsuit attacking the bona fides of the election with no no evidence that such was the case. There were over 55 lawsuits filed by Republicans in 2021 
in the end of 2020, the beginning of 2021, attacking the results of the election, and none of them prevailed because they did not provide any evidence. So for someone who loves the law to vote against certifying election without any evidence that the election was in any way not valid is, to me, just incomprehensible. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Representative Griffith. Even now, former President Donald Trump and his allies are attempting to sow doubt in the legitimacy of the 2024 election, despite no evidence of widespread voter fraud. Do you condemn these actions? And will you vote to certify the results of the 2024 election, regardless of its outcome? Look, this is where my opponent has misunderstood what I said. I look at whether or not the states follow the law in selecting their electors. If they don't follow the law, as the unanimous Supreme Court said, you leave that safe haven, your electors are subject to challenge by Congress. The Democrats in 2020 didn't choose to challenge any. There were some states that didn't follow the law who voted for Donald Trump. The bottom line is this. If the states will follow the federal law in their election process, and the law is pretty easy to follow, the legislature can change a lot, the state legislature can change a lot of things. But the governor doesn't have that power. The election commission for the state doesn't have that power. A judge doesn't have that power. It has to go back to the state legislature. The Constitution is very clear on that. If they follow the law, then I will not have a reason to challenge them at all. As I said, I think the states have to look at whether or not there was fraud. I think the states have to look at whether or not there was some kind of a mishap in the actual voting. But if you didn't follow the law in the first place, your state has left that safe harbor. I'm using the unanimous Supreme Court decision of of 2000. You've left that safe harbor, and you're up to being questioned. So at this point, look, I want us to have a, a, a fair election. I want it to be straightforward. I always said I never saw anything in Virginia that I thought was a problem, even in, in 2020 and 2021. But there were states that there were significant problems, and in some of those states, the margins may very well have been tweaked by actions that I believe were taken by the states that were illegal. The fraud issue is a whole other issue. And interestingly, subsequent to, and, and once you get past January 6th, it's over. It's over. That's the end of it whether I like it or not. January 6th is it, and then I, you know, you have your uh, inauguration. But subsequent to all of that, several of the state courts have then come back and said, yeah, the state didn't follow the law on this. So it's not true that there weren't decisions by the courts that indicated the arguments that I made and that I would have liked to have made if it hadn't been for the hoodlums that broke into the Capitol and committed violence did. And I will say this. I was following what I believed to be the law and to be my duty as a congressman hoodlums breaking into the Capitol doesn't change that vote. That's not the issue. The issue is what's the right thing to do. And even in the face of all the turmoil we had that day, I was on the floor from 95% of it. And I did what I thought was right. And I will always do what I think is right in representing the ninth district, popular or not. Thank you, Representative Griffith. Ms. Baker, you have two minutes to respond. I really have nothing to say. I, I, my, other than this, my opponent keeps talking about decisions by courts and they, the states were illegal. There were 55 lawsuits filed claiming that the state's actions were illegal and nullified various decisions, nullified the results 55 different times. He was part of this. And nobody, no court found that the election was improper or the results were affected by anything that was done. So I stand by my original statement that the the election was fairly run and fairly decided. Um, The Republicans, of course, didn't complain about any election results in a state where Mr. Trump won. They only complained about it in states he didn't win. And the fact is, The election results were tested in court after court, in jurisdiction after jurisdiction across the United States, and the election was fair. So it's over. Thank you, Ms. Baker. 
As a reminder, you are tuned in to WUVT 90.7 Blacksburg with simulcast on WEHC 90.7 Emory. This is a live congressional debate for Virginia's 9th District. We are joined by Republican incumbent Morgan Griffith and Democratic challenger Karen Baker. And it looks like we, we have a little extra time on our hands um, to ask some more questions to both of you. Um, so first off, and again, this is posed to both of you, uh, since Representative Griffith started last time, we'll have Ms. Baker start this time. 2023 and 2024 have seen a marked increase in anti-transgender and anti-LGBT laws. Many of these have impacts in public schools. In Virginia, Glenn Youngkin's Department of Education policy states that parents have the final say on which names and pronouns their child will use in school, as well as if their child engages in any, quote, counseling or social transition at school that encourages a gender that differs from their child's sex, unquote. LGBT advocates claim this policy can lead to a hostile environment for trans youth. Does this trend trend worry you? It does. It does. Let me say that um, adolescents are always searching. Um, They're searching for their identity. And um, what name a student uses in school, as far as I can remember going back 70 years, kids had names in school that their parents didn't give them. So they might have been Butch or Curly or something else back back in the Dark Ages. But kids have always had alternate realities at school than they've had at home. That's not to do. That's nothing to do with anything other than their adolescence. They have other ideas about themselves. They're trying out identities. They're trying out who they are going to be as an adult. And so all this emphasis on squelching anything that a student, a young person might think about in their life, it's not going to help them in their lives. It's ridiculous. So I think that we should all damp it down a little bit and quit being so concerned. Interestingly, Carroll County, I went to the high school's opening of of a new wing of the high school, and all the bathrooms were individual stalls. And the locker room was a unisex locker room with individual stalls, and each stall had a shower and a changing room so that kids could all go to the locker room together and then take showers and go to the bathroom individually. And I asked, what was the basis for this? And Carroll County said, we just decided that we didn't want to fight about anything about whose sex was what and whose gender was what, and we would just take care of it, and it's no longer an issue. And I said, good on you because they decided to just leave this be. It's not a matter for parents to say that Johnny can't be called Jimmy or Jeff or Curly or Bobby or even Sue. As I recall, Johnny Cash talked about a boy named Sue. So it's not a new issue. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Representative Griffith, uh, you have three minutes to respond. Yeah, look, I'm gonna support parents. I'm going to support parents being involved in their children's lives. I don't believe the federal government or the state government should take over the right of the parent uh, in making decisions for their children. If there's a significant problem, we have courts that that people can go to. Uh, I don't think there's going to be a significant problem in the vast majority of families. Yeah, there's always going to be a problem in, in some family. But the bottom line is this is a parental decision. And in many cases across the Commonwealth, not Carroll, but in many cases across the Commonwealth, we have had school systems, school administrators, and some teachers who have been hiding information from parents because they don't believe the parents have a right to be involved. I'm sorry. I'm with the parents on this. I do have to make an aside about a a boy named Sue. Uh, It was a song about a man who'd been named by his parent. His father named him Sue, and he hated him for it until they went and they fought in the blood, the mud, and the beer uh, in a big fight. And the whole song was about how when he had a chance to have a son, he was going to name him anything but Sue. So, you know, it's not really a relevant song in this case, but I will say this. I stand with parents, and I will stand with parents to make decisions for their children. And I think the reason you see a huge growth in private schools and homeschooling is because Parents no longer feel that the public school system, in many cases, actually looks out for their children and for the parents' right to be involved in their children's lives. I will stand with parents. 
Thank you, Representative Griffith. Um, moving on to uh, the next question, because I believe, does anybody have any rebuttal there? Or, yeah, I do. I do have rebuttal. Um, in the Ninth District, I think the major issue is our kids getting um, the, the the tools we need to have an education. We get worn out Chromebooks that Hamptons Roads doesn't want anymore sent to us for our kids to use. We don't have our teachers don't get enough pay. Our um, the 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 Virginia system of allotting monies to our schools doesn't provide for our schools to have the things we need to have a 21st century education. And our kids frequently don't have broadband or even cell service that they could do their homework on at home. So I think in the ninth district, our biggest issue and what parents really worry about is our kids getting a quality education. And that's what I'm all about. I'm all about our kids getting the education they need and let the culture wars rage up above as a means to keep us separated and a means to keep everybody in turmoil. I'm going to work for a good education for our kids. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Representative Griffith, do you have a response? I, I, I do. I mean, I agree that there's a big problem in the, in the state uh, Virginia system. It's gotten worse over the years. There were lawsuits a few years ago. They failed. I'm not so sure they wouldn't succeed today that there's a disparity when the Constitution of Virginia calls for there not to be such a large disparity between the haves and the have-nots. And Northern Virginia and Eastern Virginia have a whole lot more in their school systems than Southwest Virginia. But guess what? If Ms. Baker wants to do something about that, she should run for the House of Delegates or the State Senate, not the United States Congress. I will not stand by and support a federal takeover of our local school systems. That's just crazy. And right now, statewide, the average is about 94% is local and state money, not federal money. Now, there are some valuable federal programs, particularly with disabled children and in our school lunch program. So we may be able to do some assistance. And we did do some assistance with COVID money, saying the schools could retrofit and do things to help make it better. But the federal government cannot take on every state's responsibility to make sure that education is right. I think that's a state issue, and I would encourage local governments to sue the state because I don't think they're doing in Southwest Virginia what they ought to. But it's not the federal government's job to get state of Virginia straightened out between northern Virginia and southwest Virginia. So I, I encourage you to run for the state senator or the House of Delegates. Thank you, Representative Griffith. We will now be moving on to closing statements. Each candidate will be given three minutes. Ms. Baker, you may begin. Part of my closing statement is going to be to deal with Representative Griffiths, my opponent's view, that there's nothing to be done from the federal government for the states in, in terms of education. In, our, in the 9th District, about 25% of our funding comes from the federal government for um, services for special needs. I'm not proposing that we take over the state system. I am proposing that the bully pulpit that the representative who represents the 9th District has and can use to make the argument for our needs is a powerful pulpit. It's been squandered by my opponent. The 14 years he's had and the almost 30 years as that he has had as a politician has been marked by his saying, it's not my problem, it's not my place, it's not this, it's not that. Interestingly, this year in May, when told about the problem with the loss of maternity services in Martinsville, he told the Martinsville Bulletin, well, there's nothing that can be done about it, but if you think of something, give me a call. I see the representative from the 9th District as a leader who is going to shine a light on our problems, who is going to get all of our people involved in standing up and making a large voice for us, which means working with our boards of supervisors to work together and to together attack the state's funding mechanism because they'll have a leader that'll bring them together. Our, our district has been allowed to be little fiefdoms all over, the, all over Southwest Virginia, the size of New Jersey, where people don't work together because there's no leadership for people to work together. I will bring leadership. I will make us have a very large voice, both in Virginia and throughout Appalachia, 
to bring our plight to bear on the people of the United States and to seek larger-than-life solutions for the very real problems in the Ninth District. As I said before, when he got elected, we got neglected. It's time to reverse that process. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baker. I've worked hard. Switch that camera around. <laughs> I've worked hard for the people of the 9th District over the years. I've worked hard to bring new programs in. You know, it's interesting how uh, my opponent likes to twist words. And I said we were going to have disagreements, but let's at least get the facts right. You all heard it. I said the federal government has a role in disabled students, that they have very good programs in that. Then she said, I said there was nothing that could be done. I would already just mentioned that just 30 seconds before, but she twisted that into me saying nothing. Same thing true with the Martinsville newspaper article she quoted. You go back and look at those quotes. I didn't say what she says I said. It's a significant problem. We don't have enough doctors in Southwest Virginia. We don't have enough doctors in Southside. We don't have the doctors to make it so they don't have to worry about malpractice lawsuits at the Martinsville Hospital. So as a result, they feel like they need to send their patients somewhere where they can get better care. Is that ideal? Of course not. And I will always be looking for ideas. My opponent said she would listen to, for people's ideas. I ask for ideas. She criticizes me for asking for you to give me ideas if you've got them. Bold new ideas. And she said she'd be a strong voice throughout Appalachia. That's what the whole Ambler program is about. Remember what I said. I said that in order to get Virginia in, I brought in two additional states. So we expanded it from West Virginia, Kentucky, Pennsylvania to Virginia, Alabama, and Ohio. So I have a lot of credibility in the Appalachian region as a whole. They recognize me as a leader. They recognize that some, what we're doing for economic development is helping. Is it helping fast enough? Some will argue it isn't. I get that. But I will submit to you that I have been working hard. I continue to work hard. I crisscross this district. I'm in Washington, D.C. a lot of the time. When I'm not in Washington, D.C., a majority of the time, I'm crisscrossing the district. We also communicate with a lot of the people in the district, and ideas percolate up. Got an idea from a school teacher uh, recently that, you know, was they needed an increased tax credit on the supplies that they spend money for. That bill's already been put in because I listened to constituents. I also had a, an idea brought to me about babies that are born or that, that are basically dead at birth. They don't get a tax credit like most parents do. If their baby takes one breath, you get a tax credit. You still have to deliver that baby. I listened to a constituent. We've introduced legislation. So I will continue to represent the 9th District of Virginia. I will continue to provide that conservative voice in Washington, D.C. I will fight against the progressives. I will fight against the socialists. I will fight against all of those in the Democrat Party who want the federal government to take over everything from school systems all the way up to what you do at your house and what kind of car you drive because I'm not in favor of mandating EV vehicles but the Democrat Party is, I'll continue to take your, your voice to Washington, D.C. I will defend your gun rights, I will defend life, and I will defend our shared conservative values. Thank you very much. God bless everybody. And that concludes our debate for Virginia's 9th Congressional District. If you tuned in late or just want to listen again, the entirety of this evening's debate will be posted on the WUVT-FM YouTube channel. WUVT News would once again like to thank both candidates for joining us today. Good evening, Blacksburg.